Hello, what's the crack? What's the story? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're checking out the part two of the documentary about the Bee Gees. This is where I came in. Let's go. I went to look for them because it was getting them, you know, bedtime. And I walked through the town and I saw this fire engine. And I thought, oh, oh no, fire. and you. I think she's talking about Robin setting up fire, setting fire every single time, every single time. And you was behind it. <laughs> and they did all the lot of damage. Oh, so God. we got to the top of the hill and and, and, um, and there were all the billboards burning. And it was what? a fantastic sight. And, um, <laughs> Robin. and there was a policeman standing right next to us and we had our co swimming costumes and our towels underneath our arms, you know. And we, we looked at the policeman and he looked at us and, and what happened, you know? <laughs> and he said, you know, don't worry, we'll catch him. We'll catch him. <laughs> and we sort of stood there. Yes, we hope you do, officer, yeah. <laughs> it was them. And <laughs> but that was the end of it. The police did come one day and said, look, then some reform school, but they said it could end up to a point where you would have to go to court. Oh, and, God. Uh, and be charged and be sent to a reform school if it got out of hand. I think actually it was the Manchester police that sort of encouraged my mother and father to go to Australia, you know, <laughs> take them. <laughs> you know. And he said, you know, maybe it's time you thought about emigrating mm. because maybe these kids, they need more, they need space. <laughs> wow. So, in 1958, with newborn baby Andy in tow, Hugh and Barbara decided the family needed to make a fresh start. I'd never heard of Australia, just a strange word Ooh. to me, Australia, I'm sort of Australia. When you're eight years old, seven or eight years old, it's an adventure. This is like, wow, I imagine like kangaroos going down the streets of Sydney mm. and all these sort of adventurous place that we're gonna go to, exotic, different, you know. Oh, amazing, adventure. Because that, that was what was in our spirit. Mm -hmm. That's why we were always getting into mischief. The idea of what's around the corner really was inside us. So the idea of going to Australia, we didn't even know what that was. But <laughs> sounds good, let's try it. The Gibbs settled in Queensland, a state in northeast Australia known for its sunshine, beautiful beaches, and the Great Barrier Reef. Ooh. Hugh took a job as a photographer. He bought an 8mm camera, and the <laughs> brothers immediately began making home movies. I was filming them. <laughs> I was always the guy behind the camera, because I've always been the technical one. Uh, Barry and Robin, I wouldn't go as far as to say that the <laughs> video take which players are still flashing 12, but <laughs> it's... <laughs> He's gadget man, yeah. Um, it, whatever's new, um, Morris had bought yesterday, you know. Mm. He's that type of gadget freak, you know. But it, it, you, you could see it in those days. His fascination with cameras, his fascination with uh, eight millimeter filming. So, so in our very early home movies, the reason you see so much of Robin and me is because Morris is doing the filming. We'd film. Home movies of fights and things and people like hostage taking or you know people blowing up the tower you know we used to just come up with some daft stuff looks like they were just having fun they were just like normal kids just like me and you when we were younger they're just having so much fun fair play to them humor that we have is very a very british sense of humor and it really it's really been and always has been strongly influenced by peter sellers spike milligan and harry seacom they made up the Goons, which was a BBC radio show mm. when we were growing up. And it was totally left field. They would come out with lines like, uh, right, men, are you ready? We leave at dawn tonight. You know, and it would be very quick and very, very sort of weird sort of sense of humor. But it was a very dry English sense of humor. Mm. And we got into that big time. We loved it. Mm. No, it's always been there and they always make you laugh. Um, they bounce off one another. Just little mm. things that can make it sound hilarious. Wow. In Australia, the brothers continued their quest for fame. To achieve that goal, they would sing just about anywhere. We always looked for the best toilets in town. Toilets? <laughs> so we've worked in some of the best toilets, let me tell you. <laughs> toilets? We'd go and sing in there because of the echo. Oh. And there's a great one I remember in, in Pitt Street, Sydney. It, no, it was in the park, and it was a great echo. Really long, and, and it was, we, we sang these harmonies. They sounded like records. The brothers took their act to a local speedway, where they sang between races. The crowd oh. showed their appreciation by throwing coins. Bill Gates, a local disc jockey, was impressed and persuaded Hugh and Barbara to let him promote the boys. As the initials BG were everywhere, Bill Gates, Barbara Gibb, Barry Gibb, Brothers Gibb, it was suggested that the trio be called the Bee Gees. 
soon, Good the idea. boys were heard regularly on Gates' radio show. In the summer of 1960, the Bee Gees got their next big break. The Bee Gees, Barry A, the leader of the group, come here. Barry Gibb wow. and Gian, Gian young young Gibbs. Look. Now, come on, who are you? Which is which? Your twins, eh? I'm Robin. Robin? Morris. And Morris. Now, you all seem together, eh? That's right. And your brother, Barry Place. Now, come on up. Come on up here. This was the first of what would be many TV appearances <laughs> over the next few years. To be fair, I think they look alike when they were younger. I think Robin and Morris and Morris look alike when they're very when they're younger. Like the older they get, they kind of you know went apart. But yeah, yeah, they look really alike here. Let me know what you guys think. The Bee Gees played county fairs and clubs where they honed their craft as performers. With the act still in its formative stages, show business veteran Hugh became their manager. My father, bless him, has been unbelievable in our lives. Mm. He, he has been a main instigator of everything that we learned about the stage. Oh, my old man, the dustman, he wears the dustman. Is the medley, I've seen this. <laughs> Even down to little things like when you go on, smile, because if you look like crap and you feel like crap, so will the audience. Smile, they'll smile with you. He taught us professionalism. I said, no, I ain't gone dead. You're getting past your prime. And I was doing the clothes, we used to make all the, the little waistcoats. And we cut an old pair of evening shoes up to make BG and gold <laughs> leather on the <laughs> little things, you know. Every time I think of mum, I just vision her behind the ironing board, <laughs> mining the shirts. I washed and ironed 42 shirts wow. when they were going on tour. Barry wouldn't 42. let me send anything to the laundry. I used to wash them and I didn't have a washing machine. Did them all by hand and wow. then ironed all these shirts. And so I worked. Mom, I worked mom legend. Now if you see a dustman, all looking all pale and sad, don't kick him in the dustbin. It might be my old dad. When we first started doing professional stuff, we were kind of like a, a child act doing mm -hmm. the clubs in and around Sydney. You ever see that one at the beginning of Crocodile Dundee? <laughs> that we work places like that. So to give you an idea, it was very rough. Wow. Working men's clubs and leagues clubs and stuff, where they had slot machines and stuff. You had to have a kind of act that would be entertaining to them. But we always had to put humour into the act, you know. For years, actually, Robin was the comedian in the club <laughs> act, and I was the straight man. He does look And Barry was the older brother. <laughs> it was like a mixture of the Smothers Brothers, I guess. <laughs> a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we did that because the mums and dads loved it. That's what you worked in front of. We didn't work in front of teenagers for, until we were teenagers. So Morris would have a tie that would go up, you know, and sort of a, a tie with an erection, if, if you will. Or if you want, you know. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, he would do that during the show, and he would do it in the middle of a song, and it'd be fantastic, you know, because you'd be singing a dramatic song, and the tie would suddenly start to come up, you know. Wow. And I think the audience loved that stuff, you know, because it's the last thing they expect in the world. So, unexpected humour is the best. Mm -hmm. In 1963, their dream of becoming stars took a giant leap forward. They signed a record contract. Ooh, you know, we were always on our way somewhere. Is that yeah? That's the end of part two. Literally, I'm really, really enjoying it. It's like a little mini series that we're doing together, and I'm just really enjoying it. If you want to keep seeing it, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, because I like doing this. You know, I'm learning so much about the Bee Gees, so much, so much, and I'm really enjoying it. So make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.